So, good morning. This is uh, Lecture 3 of the Religions of Ancient Israel by Rabbi Lawrence Troster, and we're going to pick it up where we um, uh, had it last week. Um, I've given you new material uh, that covers what we did, uh, what was on last week's material, but also has a lot of new stuff um, that I hope we will certainly get to. And um, we were talking about the character... Uh, there is, the new stuff is over there. Um, we were talking about the character of God. And uh, we talked about God's epithets and how God appears in various texts. And I hope if you looked at the YouTube, I've actually integrated the written material in with the pictures. And I tried to go through the recording so that it, it, <laughs> it kind of fit uh, the pictures. I hope, uh, you know, it's not 100%, but, I, you know, anyway. So the thing I want to talk about is what's, um, what uh, Ben Summer calls divine fluidity. Um, and here we are back to our picture of this famous inscription, um, uh, which we'll look at it two more times today. And again, notice the idea that it's yud Hey vav Hey of Samaria, right? In other words, um, God of Israel specifically associated, so even the, 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 this, this is... Oh, that's, that's okay. Uh, so, um, uh, even though this was found in what would have been the border of Judea, in a border fortress or town uh, of Judea, now northern Sinai, um, it's referring to the god uh, yod heh vav -Heh of Samaria, Shomron. Now, um, uh, this, by the way, is from a, uh, a large um, uh, uh, vessel, jar, and um, it's probably an amulet, amuletic. Um, uh, kind of thing, but notice the connection specifically with a geographical locale that is not the place it was found. Uh, and then we go back to this other piece from the same place. You can see the, the jar shape, and here it's referring to yod heh vav -Heh of Teman. And Teman is, the, is essentially the area of Edom. Um, today in modern Hebrew it's for Yemen, but it means, in Biblical Hebrew, it means the south. And usually the south, the area of what's called Moab, which is the area now of uh, Jordan that is north of the Red Sea and east of the, uh, the, the, the Rift Valley that, that the Dead Sea's in. So again, found in northern uh, uh, Sinai, which was again the border of Judea, and uh, from somewhere else. This one's more geographically, uh, you know, better from where it was found, okay? This stuff is uh, 8th century, what does it say? What did I say it was 8th century, 8th century BCE. It's pretty early. Um, it's in the monarchy period, but in Judea. Um, so, the thing is, what is going on here? Well, there are a couple of biblical examples of this as well. Um, on page 451, in the uh, final blessing of uh, Moses, um, it refers to um, verse 16, chapter 33, verse 16. Excuse me. It refers to God um, as the um, dweller or indwelling or presence in the bush. Sne, which puts, this is a very old poem, um, and uh, therefore puts God um, at Sinai. And if you look at another text, which is uh, 2 Kings chapter 13, um, which is on... Uh, well, one second. Um, it's at the page 806. What was the question? On page 451. Uh, yes, now in the bush. Okay, referring to Sinai, therefore. Now, if you go to page 806, um, it's referring to um, the house of Jeroboam. And 806? 806. Um, it's talking about the sins of the northern kingdom. The house of Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit. They persisted in them. Even the sacred post stood at Samaria. Okay, now the word there for sacred post is Asherah, which we will get back to. Um, in this case, it does mean a post, uh, and it is not referring to a foreign god, but rather a, a wooden pole, which is at the center of a worship site that represents yod heh vav -Heh. Okay, I'm skipping ahead a bit of that, but I'll get back to that. So again, very localized idea 
about God, and there are numerous examples of that that I've given you um, as well. Um, uh, that from let's let's look at a couple others. Go to Second Samuel fifteen. Which fifteen seven, uh, which is on six seventy six, right? Uh, you'll notice this is um, the story of Absalom, uh, Absalom, and he is um, asking to uh, go. Uh, this is his trick to get out of the king's supervision, so he can um, uh, create a revolt. And he says, after a period of uh, forty years, that's probably wrong, four years gone by, Absalom said to the king, let me go to Hebron and fulfill a vow I made to the Lord. For your servant made a vow when I lived in Geshur of Aram. If the Lord ever brings me back to Jerusalem, I will worship the Lord. So the question is, uh, why does he have to go to Hebron? Um, and if he made the vow in the Transjordan, uh, why is he leaving Jerusalem to go to Hebron? Well, Hebron, of course, is the capital of Judea where uh, David was first king. Um, but it suggests that when he made the vow, he made the vow to yud heh vav -Hey of Hebron. In other words, a localized yud heh vav -Hey. And he made it from a different place. Right? Okay. Um, Couldn't it just have meant that there was a shrine there that... Did it have to mean that this, that there were other places as well? That's the point. The localized name is usually attached to a shrine, to a local shrine. Now we'll 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 get back to that. Um, let's take um, again. There are numerous examples of this. So that's the first thing you have to point out is that this was not unusual in the ancient Near East that you had a god. And then you had local shrines to that god in numerous places. In those particular places, that god was referred to like Marduk of, you know, Ur, right? And what was going on here? What was going on here was not that every place where there was a shrine that the god was named for that place, that it was a separate god, but rather the idea that the god could manifest himself in the had manifested themselves and continue to manifest himself in those places so even though we, last time i talked about the fact that god has a body right it's not like our body it has the ability to be in more than one place at one time that beeping is from that uh, defibrillator we've already told the office about it uh, sorry about it um, anyway um, i know it's it's annoying so the, this is called divine fluidity, fluidity, whereas a human body cannot be in more than one place at one time, a divine body can. And therefore, if you have a particular relationship with that God in that particular place, that is the God you are going to evoke, right? So some, for some reason, in, this, in these things from northern um, uh, uh, Sinai, southern Judea, um, they're evoking um, yod heh vav -Hey from somewhere else. Yeah. Would you say that that in Catholicism today it would be similar to Our Lady of Fatima? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and in a certain sense, it's not a big hop, skip, and a jump, by the way, um, to the theology of the synagogue, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Paul asked, you know, last mm -hmm. time, how can God have a body if he's everywhere? Well, this is how, Right. In other words, um, the God who can manifest himself in more than one place at one time. And in the early texts of the Tanakh, this seems to be the theology of God. Okay? Later on, as we will eventually see, the P people and the D people don't believe this. To them, this is too close to polytheism and paganism. So they eliminate this idea. They get rid of it. You know, the P people, God's presence is only in the temple. The D people say, no, God never lives in the earth. God only lives in heaven. Never comes down. Okay? Which one is that last one? D, the Deuteronomy people. So what you'll see when we get to it is there is this rejection of the divine fluidity model. That God 
has a kind of a body, and, and you can define a body, by the way, as a form with limits to it, you know, that, but um, the divine body can be in more than one place at one time, all right? Now, the question, the second thing is, of course, that um, how, does the, how does the divine body get manifested in those places? So here, again, in the early texts, you're going to um, see how this can happen. And what we have in the Tanakh, in early texts, are many examples of an ambivalence when, uh, when an angel shows up. Sometimes the angel is speaking in a voice of the angel as a separate character, and then it shifts to the angel, the voice of God coming out of the angel. And there seems to be this back and forth ambivalence. So, for example, in Genesis chapter 18, um, which is on page 30, when um, Abraham, this is right after the circumcision, he is in Mamre, he's sitting there, and it says three men come over to him. And, and angels are often referred to as men. But as the conversation goes on, it appears that one of these so-called men is yud heh vav -Hey, But it's very equivocal, right? Um, it could be another angel. Um, are, are you saying that in these early times, yeah. they felt that God had a human form? Not a human form, a human-like form, not made of the same kind of material that we're made of and the ability to be in more than one place at one time, okay? And this was often referred to as the kavod, the presence, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what you have here is many different uh, situations, like in Judges chapter 6, and we don't have to look at each one of these texts, um, Gideon is being uh, spoken to, and it, it flips back and forth in the entire dialogue between an angel speaking and yod heh -Vav -Heh speaking at the same time. So... What you have in the Tanakh is the angel sometimes seems to be a completely separate entity from God that is like a divine servant, messenger, agent. And then you have times where it seems that that boundary between the angel and God is completely blurred. Another example is for um, when a God's wrath, right, um, in, the, in the killing of the firstborn, in the last plague, one of the early texts refers to God's, refers to the destroyer, which appears to be almost like a separate entity from God, a kind of, well, later tradition said it was the angel of death, right? Um, but the destroyer, the mashchit, as it's called, in fact, is the aspect of God that is the punishing aspect often later on referred to as the wrath of God. But the wrath of God is almost spoken as if it's separate from God, but it's not really separate from God. It's this wonderful ambiguity which suggests a certain fluidity in how God gets manifested. Sometimes, in, in first of all, geographically, it's possible in many different locales. Secondly, in different guises, right? So that's, that's the important part that we have to understand, okay? Rabbi, these, the, what you're talking about uh, you are totally conversant with, yeah. but we aren't. Yes. So w would you mind giving us an example of how you can have both the local and the, shall we say, ethereal? Well, again, look at Judges chapter 6. The, the, that's the one I was referring to. So you, 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 you get it directly there. You'll see it. Just six, six, chapter six. Six seventeen. Yeah, it's on page yes. five twenty-eight. Five twenty-eight. Um, it, it's part of the, the whole thing in Judges where the Israelites do sin, and then God brings a foreign group, and then they cry out to God, and God decides to give them a uh, a leader to you know drive the enemy away, a shofate, a judge. So if you look at verse eleven on page five twenty-eight. Um, Suzanne, you want to begin reading? Sure. An angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at of Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiyah's right. By the way, um, it's not unusual for God to show up near a tree. Okay? And an Asherah, whatever its origin, is a tree or a wooden pole. 
Okay, we'll get to that. Go on. Okay, his son Gideon was then beating out wheat inside a wine press in order to keep it safe from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, valiant warrior. Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this befallen us? Where are all his wondrous deeds about which our fathers told us, saying, Truly the Lord brought us up from Egypt. Now the Lord has abandoned us and delivered us into the hands of Midian. So the uh, Gideon is complaining about the oppression and where is God? Then read on. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in this strength of yours and deliver Israel from the Midianites. I herewith make you my messenger. Notice it starts with an angel and all of a sudden it says the Lord turned to him. What's the, what word do they use for Lord? And yod heh vav heh. They use yod heh vav Okay. Um, so the point is that it seems as if now the angel is not an angel. It's actually a pre the, the God. yod heh vav heh. And if you read through this, um, it's a... Um, uh, it goes back and forth like that. Of course, it could be an angel accompanied by God. <laughs> it doesn't say that, though. I know, I know. It doesn't say that, though. And, and, and why should it? In other words, the why isn't it just the angel? Why doesn't it just keep saying the angel? But no, it's flipping back and forth. It feels like the, the, the angel is there and God is speaking through the angel. The Lord is speaking. And so when the Lord says... Through the through the angel, yeah, that we understand, you know, as if we all understand this is a convention which the Lord uses. No, it's very clear. If you read the, if the you angel read speaks. Eleven, an angel of the Lord came, and then you go to fourteen. The Lord turned Turn to him. Said. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's absolutely clear. It's absolutely, and there are numerous examples oh. of this, by the way. Okay, this is not the only. This is one of the best. But uh, you know, no, yes. But I, I still feel that way. But I, what's I, I but, hear, but, but, but no? But what? But George, what's the in the end? Then what's the difference between the the physical manifestation of the angel and the physical manifestation of God? There doesn't seem to be a separation there. You know what I mean? When well, you say speaking through, the I, angel is not quoted as quoting God. The now well, that's right. This is this is not the angel is not quoting God. Right. This is God speaking. Um, yeah. yeah, it means now it's God. Rabbi, it's, and, and verse 13, yeah. there's a lowercase Lord yeah. and an uppercase Lord. So what is the lowercase That's Lord? where the actual Hebrew is my Lord, as opposed to yud heh vav -Hey. Remember, they, they always translate yud heh vav -Hey here as the Lord. Lord. Okay? So when he says, um, please my Lord, that's actually using the actual Hebrew for my Lord, as opposed to yud heh vav -Hey. Okay. Uh, verse 15, please my Lord, how can I, well, verse 13, yeah, it goes back, yeah, that's, yeah, exactly, all right, Adonai could also be translated as sir, yeah, exactly, that's a good point, yeah, please, but it's my Lord, it's, you know, there is the, in it, but anyway, so the point is that you, there, you, there, this, this, there are numerous instances of this, where there seems to be this ambiguous separation between a messenger and the actual presence of God. Um, and I've given you a bunch of them here. We don't have to look at all of them. So, so first now we know that God can be localized in a shrine. God's presence is not confined, as it were, to the way our presence is, right? In other words, if I'm a king and I send Cal as my messenger to speak for me, Cal is always going to be Cal, right? Even if he says, King Larry said, <laughs> right. you know, it's still him talking, right? It's like a prophet, right? A prophet is never God. Even, even if he says, no, you may not do this, you have to stay inside. And then yeah, exactly. We still understand he's saying it on behalf exactly. of the king. Exactly, exactly. So the analogy, so this is the radical difference between God and God as a king and an earthly king is that God can become his own messenger whenever he wants. What, in the guise of an angel. Well, what is an angel, though? He couldn't do it with a prophet, could he? <laughs> no, no, he doesn't do it with a prophet. So, it, so it, uh, this hinges on, his, uh, on there being this yeah. special transmission. Device. Yeah, exactly. There are these divine, uh, uh, there's a divine court. And some of them are messengers, agents of God that are sent. We we are not. We don't really know what they look like. They don't. They don't. They don't have wings necessarily. Uh, we know that they're not human. 
uh, even though they're often referred to as the man because it makes pretty clear that it's not a human being. Um, and many, many times, by the way, the people they visit at first don't know that it's an angel, so it appears in a human guise, uh, but then something shows them that they're not talking to a human being. Yeah. In terms of time, yeah. are the, prophet, the prophets are later? Than well, uh, yeah. And does the, do the angels stop when the prophets come on the scene and say and speak for God? Uh, at a, there are prophets before this, as we will see, but they're of a kind, different kind. You're right. When you get to the, the great prophets, okay, well, you know, like Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, Hosea, um, essentially, yeah, you don't find uh, angels around anymore. In other words, they're, the prophets, I think you made a good point, in some respects, the prophets become what an angelic messenger is, but with a big difference, that they, they're always in the human body. In other words, God has heavenly servants and God has earthly servants. And by the way, the priests are, in effect, uh, a better analogy is the priests are God's earthly servants, right? But so prophets too. The priests in the temple. Yeah, and, and the local shrines. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Sorry. So go ahead, Suzanne. No, just say, so it's an evolution. Where was, you're there is going to be an absolutely. And then later. Absolutely, there is going to be a, within those schools that oppose this early idea. Yes, there is definitely an evolution. What the average person believed, probably not. Okay. For those of us who. Are mired in the documentary hypothesis. Yeah, you don't have to be mired in it. You can... <laughs> it's, it's, it's nothing wrong with it. Um, Friedman actually has, has this idea about uh, the, hidden, the hidden book in the Bible where you can go all the way through from, from when the earth started to David. With J. J. Right, yeah. So, so that you will get... Mm -hmm. spliced into little bits. That, that's yeah. why, for example, I'm so I, I'm intrigued. I don't know whether mm -hmm. Friedman has actually, actually <coughs> gone there. So if you go to Judges, whether there is a different author for verse eleven and twelve no. compared to the other. No, the, but but most what happens is ju uh, Judges is the ultimate editing of Judges are by the D people, but the material, a lot of the material, is pretty early. So the Gideon story. You know, it's probably from a cycle of stories about Gideon the warrior, and it's pretty early stuff. But what we're talking about, um, not just J, but E, or as most scholars now refer to it as J-E, J-E is where this material is, okay? It's not found in P, and it's not found in D. But from the perspective of someone that's trying to see it logically, there is this absolute dichotomy in Judges 6, between no. the angel of the Lord no, no. and then the Lord No, said, no, that's all part of the same text. It's all part, that's the important point. It's all part of the same text, okay? Um, now... It was, the, so what you're saying is, it was the writer's intention to create this ambiguity absolutely. or whatever this absolutely. was. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, again, these are probably originally from some kind of epic tales about the great warrior, Judge Gideon, you know. Um, all right, so now, how, how does, aside from coming through in this angelic manifestation, how does God manifest himself in a shrine? Okay, um, again, we know the P people believe that it's in, you know, the Holy of Holies in the Ark, you know, in front of the Ark, but, and the Deuteronomy people don't believe that God shows up on earth at all. Um, so the JE, uh, which represents this earlier uh, and more, uh, uh, you know, sort of average religion of the Israelites um, believes that God actually shows up in a physical object. All right? Now, this is one of the reasons why P and D reject this is because it's very close to paganism. All right? Mm -hmm. So how did it happen in paganism? Um, pagan, polytheists who worshipped statues of, go of their gods in Egypt and in Mesopotamia did not believe that the statue was their god. There's a in the Hebrew Bible there are satirical attacks upon the use of uh, statuary by uh, um, polytheists where it makes it sound like they believed that the statue was god. But that's a satire. All right. What happened was is that in Mesopotamia where they used three-dimensional statues of their gods primarily. Um, 
they actually believed that an aspect of the god could manifest itself in the statue if you sacralized the statue. There was a ceremony called the opening of the mouth where you took the newly made statue and through this ceremony you brought an aspect of the god into the statue and it stayed there until the statue was, um, uh, what, what do you call it, um, uh, when you violate a sacred place, um, uh, uh, sacrilege. In other words, uh, an enemy came, takes your city, takes the statues, hauls it away, you know, bashes it up a bit, whatever it's taken. Out. The god is no longer there, okay? So what they believed was, again, that there, the god could be in multiple places and multiple statues, um, if the statue was transformed through a, we might call it a quasi-magical ceremony, through a kind of ritual to bring the presence of God into the statue. So that was Mesopotamia. In the um, Northwest Semitic cultural sphere, which is um, Israel, Canaan, the Philistines, although the Philistines weren't Semitic, but nonetheless, um, the Phoenicians, the, the Syrians, the uh, Moabites, the Ammonites, all these people, the Edomites, they didn't go for three-dimensional statues, interestingly enough. What they went for were flat steelies, usually with a curved top. Um, they sometimes carved the picture of the god on the steely. Sometimes they put a symbol, and sometimes they didn't put anything at all. And they also had a very similar thing that you could make, you could manifest the god in these objects. All right? Now, in Hebrew, they're called a matzeva. Uh, we use that term for a tombstone today in, in, in Hebrew. That a tombstone in Hebrew is a ma in Yiddish pronunciation, it's a matzeva. Okay? But a matzeva, in its original context in Northwest Semitic, is a sacred stele. So, one of the most fascinating things, um, oh, this is just another example, one of the other ones of the localized god. Uh, this one is um, uh, yud hey vav hey uh, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, okay. Um, here's a picture. Um, maybe you could turn one of the lights off. Standing stones. Yes, standing stones. Um, a collection of matzevot in the Sinai, in the, sorry, in the Negev, and they date back to the late 4th century BCE. Incredibly old. And notice there's a collection of them. And apparently, all throughout the Negev, they have found collections of these standing stones um, that date way back, right, into the earliest, some of the earliest, uh, you know, habitation um, I think the in, standing in land of Israel. better observed standing. Yeah. <laughs> um, How's that? Yeah, that's yeah. Okay. Is it like so. Stonehenge? I mean, it's no, no, no. It's not Stonehenge. No, it's not. It, but, I mean, there's the idea, much, the idea. Yeah, these are about four or five feet tall, six yeah. feet tall. Not, nothing really bigger than that. Okay? Um, here's some more that were from a. Um, they, they each represent God? Is that the idea? Yeah, they probably represent a God. This is from a Canaanite temple at Chatzor. Now, Chatzor um, was a very important Canaanite city in, the, in what is now the northern Galilee. Um, a huge city. Um, um, it's mentioned in the Bible. What happened was around the time of the Israelite, the, the evolution of Israel, it was destroyed. This may be one of the few cities we can actually say was destroyed by the Israelites. Uh, and because afterwards, the le after the destruction level, there's an Israelite settlement, okay, a, a much smaller Israelite settlement. Eventually, the Israelite kings, you know, make it into something bigger, make it into a fortress, and it grows again. But it never achieves the size that it did uh, when it was a Canaanite city. And it was huge, absolutely huge. In fact, they've only excavated a very small percentage of the entire tell. It's that big. Uh, if you've never been there, it's, it's, you can go visit it, and it's one of those places that has a water tunnel, like in Jerusalem, uh, that was built by the Israelites. Anyway, in, the, in Chatzor, they found um, from the um, 
13th century BCE, in other words, not too long before the destruction of the Canaanite city, they found a temple, all right, a Canaanite temple, and these were in the temple. This is now all in the Israel Museum. If you go to the Israel Museum, you'll see that exactly what you're seeing here. Now notice, notice that some of them are blank. One of them has a pair of hands, two uh, arms and hands, towards what appears to be some kind of maybe solar symbol. All right? So... Sorry, that's me. Oh. Um, this, so this is an example of what I'm talking about, that the Northwest Semites used steelies that were either blank or um, incised as a place where their gods were manifested. And you saw from the ones from here how old they are. It goes back thousands of years, this idea. And this seems to be a particular thing for Northwest Semites. Not Egyptians, not Mesopotamians. They like three-dimensional statues. They also do plaques, and, you know, and wall paintings. But they like three-dimensional statues of their gods. The Northwest Semites did not. Okay? So they, the belief was, like they did in Mesopotamia, that if you did a kind of ritual, the god became manifested in these steelies all right more than one god probably yeah in other words not just the difference yeah. being that they had their local god who could be manifest in these yeah well they were polytheists so they probably represented several gods do you right. have an sure. do you have an inkling of why they wanted them to be so bland um maybe they thought it was uh, a bad thing to try and actually imitate the figure of their god. Don't forget, our ancestors were part of this larger cultural milieu of Northwest Semites, right? It, it certainly seems further from a pig or idolatry, the, the less defined it becomes. So when it's three-dimensional, it's like the real thing. As it's two-dimensional, it's less like it, and ultimately it becomes totally ethereal. So, 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 so there is a gradation. You start off That's the way with, I see it. You start off with a statue and you no 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 you don't start off with a statue or for some reason they never have started off with a statue or or they <clears throat> statues were are unusual so when you say 3d i just assumed it was front back yeah i'm talking about like uh you know your typical um like egyptian statue of horus or whatever yeah, right that's what i meant by statue yeah exactly this and is not statuary then you come to a bland pole. No, but you're t you're and assuming a timeline. You, you're assuming yes. a time. No, 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 no. This is co uh, You know, this is exactly. this is local. This is to a local geographical area. But, but, so this but, is 11th century BC, right? Yeah. What was art like then? They, Twelve. They, they didn't make. They didn't make. Oh, sure they did. did they? Oh, of course the Egyptians had already for over a thousand years had a very sophisticated art. So did the Mesopotamians. Okay. All right. Um, this is long after the pyramids were made, all right? So here you had um, one culture in Egypt, one culture in Mesopotamia that is very big on statuary for their gods and their pharaohs and rulers and everything else, and you have this other cultural sphere that's not. It doesn't mean that you don't find some of these because, especially in north, uh, northwest Semitic areas, you often get Egyptian influence because the Egyptians occupied uh, some of those areas for a long time. They, you know, they had their little, they had their empire in that part of the part of the the world. So there is a there is influence from the Egyptians at various times. But the oldest sort of indigenous religion of Northwest Semites, this is what they did. Okay, now um, is there? So then, what happens in ancient Israel? All right, take a look on page fifty six. <clears throat> This is the famous story of Jacob's dream, right? Okay, so we all know the dream. Um, what's more important is what follows the dream from verse 16. Um, Irma, you want to read that? Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord <clears throat> is present in this place, and I did not know it. Shaken, he said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the abode of God, and that is the gateway to heaven. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar 
and poured oil on the top of it. He named that site Bethel, but previously the name of the city had been Luz. Okay, so this is, uh, we know that Bethel, Beit El, the house of El, the Canaanite god, was a sacred location before the Israelites came along. The Israelites turned it into a place of worship to yod heh vav -Heh, and it was a very important one throughout the whole history of the time, okay, until the destruction of the northern kingdom, all right? This story, in a way, is to is a kind of what's called an etiology, like how did this become a sacred place? Well, it was Jacob who did it, right? I mean, you have stories of the patriarchs setting up um, uh, altars at various places, and very likely that's an attempt to explain why there is a shrine. Why later people say, well, when, who, who started this shrine? Well, it was Abraham, or here, it was Jacob. Now, notice what he does. He says, this is the place, this is the yod heh vav -Heh is present in this place. And he meant really there. And he says, this is none other than the abode of God. In, in Hebrew is Beit Elohim, literally the house of God. And it is the gateway to heaven, Shar HaShamayim. Okay? So, what does he do? He takes the stone he put under his head and he set it up as a pillar. The Hebrew is Matzevah. He sets up a matzeva. What does he do next? He pours oil on it. Now, in Israelite religion, oil was used as part of rituals of transformation. It was what was used to anoint the priests. When the priests are first, when the priesthood is created, when Aaron and his sons are ordained as priests, there is several steps taken. They have to wash themselves, right? And then they have, they go through a, uh, well, I don't remember the exact order of this, but they have oil poured on them, they are anointed, and there is a sacrifice done where they are also anointed with blood from the sacrifice. So oil, one second, Robert, oil and blood, because very often, you know, a sacrifice is part of this transformation, are transformative rituals. Who else becomes anointed? The king, right? As soon as Saul becomes anointed with oil by Samuel, the it specifically says he was a different man. The spirit of the Lord came into him. He was transformed, right? So that transformation ritual was used to turn an ordinary stone, steely, a matzeva, into a place where God dwelled locally. In other words, a perfectly good Northwest Semitic ritual, but now only applied to one God. Not a multiple gods, one God. And what we find is there are similar things found in some Israelite shrines, okay? Um, for example, this. This is um, from Shechem, and it dates to the 12th century BCE, the earliest period of Israelite occupation. It's the remains of a large stone stele near a... Um, sacrificial site, what's called a Bama. We'll talk about Bama, Bamot later. High places? Yes, high places. Outdoor, not like buildings, but outdoor, um, uh, outdoor sacred places where sacrifices were made. And right beside it is this large stele. Now, Shechem, in, according to the book of Joshua, he set up a place like this in Shechem. And some people think this is the place, or at least people thought it was a place. But the fact is, this is incredibly early. This goes back, in fact, perhaps to the time of Joshua, if Joshua really existed. So here it is. It's a very early Israelite site, and what you have is a stele, a matseva. No doubt about it. This is an Israelite um, uh, worship site. All right? What's interesting about the Israelite stele they never have any carvings on them. 
They're always blank. Which shows you that, remember the Ten Commandments? You're not supposed to make an image of God? It's not an image of God. It's a steely. It's a blank steely where God can dwell. Okay? What were the Ten Commandments in relation to the 11th century BCE? Uh, that we don't know. <clears throat> it depends on who you read. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly it's part of J.E., which means a little later than that. The Ten Commandments are probably an earlier document. Some, some people think it's an earlier document that J.E. is quoting. Some people think it's a later thing that was stuck in there. Mm -hmm. The point is that um, it's pretty early. Now, in the Judean town of Arad, archaeologists found a temple to yod heh vav -Hey. This is what it looks like. <clears throat> it's, the layout is virtually the same as Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, by the way. Okay? It has a... Um, here's where you come in from a courtyard. The altar is here. Then you have this secondary hall, the Heichal, and then a Holy of Holies, the Devere. There are two pillars on either side of this entrance. There are two incense altars, and they didn't put it on this drawing. There are two steelies in the back of the mm -hmm. Holy of Holies. All right? Now, this temple um, was destroyed by the Judeans themselves in the time of King Josiah when the Deuteronomic Revolution took hold. And when they found these steelies, they had been toppled over intentionally. So here you have an early, and, and by the way, the temple at Arad, um, you know, dates back to the Judean period, 7th, 8th century BCE. There, evidently, there was a previous shrine on the site. Arad was a fortress town, by the way. It was a very important strategic fortress of the Judeans. It was destroyed by the Babylonians. But we know that this temple was destroyed before that, when the Deuteronomic people, in effect, said, you only can have one temple, and that's the one in Jerusalem. And it's, we've got, you know, the Bible tells us Josiah did all that. But notice, so here are the two incense altars, which, by the way, in the tabernacle and in the temple, there was an incense altar right in front of the Holy of Holies. And you have two steely. Well, why do you have two? Well, we'll get to that. But the point is you have two blank steely at the back of right in the heart of the Holy of Holies. So minimally, yod heh vav -Heh gets evoked through a steely here. And the later ideology says, that's paganism, knock them down. Right? This is one of the great examples of what I'm talking about. Um, another interesting point is, is that in Israelite uh, iconography, um, both found in the uh, hints of it found in biblical texts, but also found in some uh, archaeological stuff, Israelites often symbolized God by a sun disk. Okay, because the living presence of God, when God shows up, is always associated with light and fire. And light seems to be a important quality of the physical manifestation of God. Uh, that's why Moses couldn't look at God directly, because and why um, uh, one biblical scholar says, you know, that what happened to his face, uh, it got burned like radiation. Okay, so the point is that um, the uh, God is sometimes referred to um, a, in a um, as a sun disk. Here's an example of it. Um, this is a Judean seal belonging to Ushna, servant of Ahaz. Now, Ahaz is one of the kings of Judea that's in the Bible, okay? So one of his servants, we found his seal ring. That's what it says here. But you'll notice here, there's a sun disk with two snakes on either side. The snakes are an Egyptian influence, but if you remember in, uh, when Isaiah um, uh, sees God, there are the seraphim, the burning angels. They're not called angels, they're called seraphim, which has the root of burning. And one of the words for serpents um, in is a burning. It has the same root. So this is, shows some Egyptian influence, but this is a symbol of God. One of the fascinating things about 
the hundreds of these kinds of things that they have found from the Israelite period is that almost none of the Israelite seal rings have a picture of a god on them. Whereas the Canaanite, the Phoenicians, the Philistine, they all have usually a picture of some god on the seal ring. The most you're going to get is, and the Israelite one, is a sun disk. Is that an Egyptian influence as well? It, partly yes. Partly, partly yes, but nonetheless, the idea of the, you have to, you cannot have a picture of God, the most you can do is have a sun disk. Shows you this, what do they call it, an iconic mm -hmm. religious idea. Anti-icon, right? Uh, iconoclast, yeah. okay? They didn't, it was one of the characteristics of Israelite religion that they did not picture God at all. Um, and they have never found in all of the archaeological sites a statue of yod heh vav -Heh, or a drawing of yod heh vav -Heh, except for the, possibly those ones from uh, Kuntilat Ajud, and we'll get back to that because it probably isn't a picture of him. But nonetheless, um, you just don't get it. This is one of the radical differences between the Israelites and their neighbors. Also, they didn't eat pig, by the way. That was also a very early characteristic. But here's, here is a highly unusual one. This is from this, this is by contrast. This is from the fourth century. This is from the Hellenistic period. And it was found in Gaza. And it's probably not from a Jew, because now we can speak about Jews. All right? It's from some Gazian who worshiped the God of the Jews but made a seal ring that actually shows him. And it says his name on it. It says Yahoo. All right? In other words, it's not unusual to take the yod vav -Heh and put a sh make it into a short form. It was done in people's name, like Isaiah, Yoshiahu, right? Mm -hmm. So there was some guy in Gaza, maybe he was Jewish, maybe, probably not, and look how he depicts God, an old man, sitting on a chariot, again, that's very traditional, remember? God always shows up with a, you know, the, the divine chariot, right? With wings, that's the, the cherubim. And here, he's holding a, an eagle of some sort, um, and um, he's, this is, like, but this is not from the Israelite period. This is from the Second Temple period, and probably not, <laughs> I don't think it's from a Jew. It's from somebody who you was... You don't think it's not, you think it's not from a Jew, because... That interferes with the theme no, that we... No, this is the only one that's ever been found like this. Okay? Now, if we had found a whole bunch of these, I would agree with you, Robert, that there were some Israelites and later some Jews who were making pictures of God. But this is the exception that proves the rule. So, yeah, it might have been by a Jew, but more likely it was by a non-Jew who was worshipping the God of the Jews, and this is the one way he showed it. He got some of the ideas right, you know, the cherubim, the chariot, but he draws a picture. A little object in front of him on the ground. Board. This? Yes. I don't know. Stevie. I'm not sure. And does he have something on his head, or is that just his hair? That's just his hair. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, th again, this is the exception that proves the rule. Uh, to back up just for a minute, yeah. you say now you can talk about the Jews. Is that because you've had the, um, the, the, the David and the Judea, the whole... Because what happens is the northern kingdom gets destroyed, so most of the other tribes get Judea, exiled. Yeah, and what you have left is, the, is Judah. Judah is not just the tribe of Judah. It's also Benjamin, Simon, and probably refugees right. from the north. So, but in the second temple period, the people started calling themselves the Yehudim. Okay, and, and there definitely is a, a break with, um, there's a lot of continuity, but there's a break with the past, and we can begin to, call, that's when we first speak of Judaism, as opposed to Israelite religion, all right? And there and all kinds of reasons for that. All right, let's go back, however, to this. First of all, um, let's go back to this. So, what is going on here? Who are these figures? Well, originally, because it refers to yud heh vav -Heh and his Asherah, 
people have said that this is a picture of Yudhe Vavhe and this is his consort, mm -hmm. Asherah. All right? That God had a wife and a consort. Okay? Now, later scholars have said, no, that's completely wrong. There is no Asherah depicted here. And in fact, these are not pictures of Yudhe Vavhe at all. They are pictures of the Egyptian god Bes, B-E-S, who was a male god and was a god of fertility. And we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but the fact is that it, was this, it wasn't unusual for Israelites to use Egyptian fertility fetishes, even while they were worshippers of yod heh vav -Heh. Yeah. Is that what Rachel took from Yeah, exactly. We'll talk about that. That's the Trafim. Yeah, exactly. Very good, Ellie. Um, but the point is that this is very likely, as I said, an amulet, um, and Asherah in this context means a wooden pole. What you find in most texts is the term Asherah is really is not a proper name in biblical text, but is an object, and it is a wooden pole. It's very clear it's a wooden pole. So, in addition to the stone stele, Israelites utilized, which, again, their neighbors did the same thing, they utilized wooden poles as a way of the God being manifest. Um, and wood doesn't survive, right, like stone, so we don't find these poles. And also, during the Deuteronomic Revolution, they got rid of all the poles. They knocked them down, they burned them. Okay? And there's a lot of references to that. Uh, in Deuteronomy, so you're, you're supposed to knock at these things down and get rid of them. Now, a pole is a tree, right? And as I said, it's not unusual. There's several times in the, in the early text that God manifests himself near a tree. So, the thing is, though, in the earliest period, there were probably Israelites who did believe that God had a wife. And that wife was the goddess Asherah, now a proper name. And Asherah, as a proper name, was a Canaanite goddess, exactly the same, pretty, you know, a female primarily concerned with fertility, uh, similar to gods in Egypt and Mesopotamia and the whole thing. What's interesting is, is by the time of the Israelite, um, uh, the development of ancient Israel, the Canaanites had really not really been, the worship of Asherah had declined. But nonetheless, there probably were some Israelites who believed that God had a wife or a consort. What's the, what's the proof? Okay, here is a very early Israelite object. 10th century BCE. It's what's called a cult stand. They have found a lot of these things. They have found Canaanite ones, but this one is definitely a, an Israelite one. Okay? I, sorry, I didn't put down where it was found. But the point is that it's, this, is what, this is the actual picture of it. And you'll notice, I'm going to move this back a bit more so I can see it, that it's got one, two, three, four levels on it. Everybody see that? Okay. The bottom level has a female figure with prominent breasts who are who has two lions on her side. This is definitely a goddess. This is Asherah. Okay? There's no doubt about it. Then you have these other animals here. Um, then in the second you have a tree. Right? Another symbol of a shera, a tree with animals eating from it. There's something like this at that uh, Kintil at Ajud. There's a picture of a tree. This is probably the tree of life, the Eitz Chaim in the Garden of Eden story. Okay? But is also sometimes where a shera got manifested and why the later poles were called a shera. Now, what's going on up here? You have cherubs and a sun disk. This is yod heh vav -Heh. So it's on the basis of the sun disk that you're totally comfortable in saying this is Jewish. Uh, it was also where, no, not Jewish, Israelite. It was where it was found. In other words, in it was found archaeologically and the site it was found in, the layer it was found in, was an Israelite location. Again, I'm sorry, I don't remember... 
don't remember exactly uh, where it came from. I'll, I'll find out. The problem with using that as the proof... It's not the only proof, but it is an important proof. But the problem with using that as the proof is, in archaeology, you can very easily get movements that belie the fact that it is found in a given layer. Yes, but in um, an object like this is not going to move. It's made out of clay. Um, it's not likely to move around. The fact is, is that um, it is a proof. It's not the proof. There are other things. We know, for example, that there were Judeans who were still doing this in the time of Jeremiah. Okay? Why? Go to ch uh, Jeremiah chapter 7. Um, this is, um, we're going to go to verse 18. This is on page 1025. One of the things that J Jeremiah is, uh, you know, from the D school, and look at um, what's going on. One of the things that God is um, uh, uh, telling Jeremiah, this is all, uh, this is a message uh, from God to Jeremiah. So God is, Yudhei is speaking. Um, he's saying in verse 16, um, don't, uh, often the prophet was an intermediary between God and the people. Moses did that. So first God says, don't try and do that. I won't listen to you. And then in verse 17, he says, don't you see what they're doing in the towns of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather sticks, the fathers build the fire, and the mothers knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. Okay. And they pour libations to other gods to vex me. So evidently there were still Judeans in the, you know, in the 6th century BCE, the late 6th century BCE, who were still doing some, at least according to Jeremiah, doing some goddess worship. Now if you go to chapter 44, this is after the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, go to verse 15, um, which is on page 1120. So he is talking to the refugees in Egypt. Uh, there are Judean refugees from the destruction of J Jerusalem who go to Egypt. And Jeremiah is one of them. And then he get to basically tells them, you know, you've got to, you know, mend your ways. You, you know, you. this is why this has happened. But then notice what they do, happens. Thereupon they answered Jeremiah, all the men who knew that their wives made offerings to other gods, all the women present, a large gathering, and all the people who lived in Patros in the land of Egypt. So they are angry at him. They say, we will not listen to you in the manner by which you spoke to us in the name of the Lord. On the contrary, we will do everything we have vowed to make offerings to the Queen of Heaven and to pour libations to her as we used to do. And our fathers, our kings, and our officials in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, for then we had plenty to eat, we were well off, and we suffered no misfortune. But ever since we stopped making offerings to the Queen of Heaven and pouring libations, or we have lacked everything, and we have been consumed by the sword and famine. And when we make offerings to the Queen of Heaven and pour libations, it is without our husband's approval that we make cakes in her likeness and pour libations to her. So this is the women complaining. Okay? So, um, what the heck is going on here? Um, it's evident there were some Israelites and later Judeans who believed that God had a consort. Um, and who um, worshipped her. But it was not, from anything we can see, a general thing, uh, despite what, I mean, the problem with the prophetic text, they often exaggerate things um, when it comes to this sort of stuff. Um, and when we will look at the home worship, we will see that there are fertility fetishes that are found in Israelite homes, but they're probably not goddess statues. We'll get to that. What's the purpose of putting this reference in here? The people who created this. You mean who edited the book of Jeremiah? Yeah. I mean, this is... This, well, they're reporting on what actually happened. In other words, oh, the... 
you're saying they should have self-censored themselves. Well, I wonder, <laughs> what's the purpose of putting this in here? Because, because the editing of... historical? Or yeah, well, first of all, it's historical. It's it's what happened to Jeremiah after, in the, in the last years of his life, um, when he was living in Egypt with the refugees, and some of them were in effect where Jeremiah is claiming that the destruction of Judea occurred because of disloyalty to yud heh vav -Heh by the Judeans. The, these Judeans are saying, on the contrary, it's because you stopped us from doing the kinds of things we used to do. In other words, they are the people who are against the Deuteronomic revolution. Right? They're the old kind of Israelite practice where you know, God showed up in pillars and in many shrines, and God had a, you know, maybe God had a consort that you made offerings to, but you were still a loyal follower of Yudei Vavhe. This was what you, how you worshipped. Right? Yeah. There was a popular novel uh, a few years ago. Yeah. The Women of Masada. Uh-huh. And the whole thing was about the worship of Asherah. Yeah, well, by the time of, you mean yeah. from the time of like the Romans? Yeah, no, I mean, said this was a, you know, a novel. That no, I know, no, but but when yeah. does it take place? Yeah. Oh, yeah. by that so point, they were Jews were not gone. doing that. Yeah. No, after the second temple was yeah. after the first temple was destroyed, Jews were not doing that anymore. Yeah. They they are just not doing that. The writer better the time the period. Period. <laughs> revolution. <laughs> well, that happens in the last years of the Northern Kingdom. Well, actually, starts earlier. It's a the people who wrote the Book of Deuteronomy had a particular view of God. They were a lot narrow in their definition of monotheism. They were against a lot of these old practices because a lot of these old practices were very similar to the Canaanite neighbors. What I'm trying to show you here is two things. On the one hand, the Israelites really were monotheists in a broad sense of the term, not the narrow definition. Remember, we talked about that. But secondly, a lot of the ways they expressed their religion was very similar to their neighbors, but with some critical differences. Right? That's what I'm trying to get across. That makes sense. All right? Now, some of the Israelites crossed over into the boundary of polytheism. They weren't really, you know, we could say they weren't monotheists, in the, even in the broadest sense. Whoever made that cult stand is not an Israelite monotheist, is an Israelite polytheist. Those who worshipped, continued to worship Asherah as a goddess, were not really monotheists. They were Israelite polytheists. Yes, they said yod heh was the most important, most powerful god, but yod heh had a wife, right? Who we pray to for fertility. Because that's what you do to female gods. God, that's what you do to goddesses. So, the picture we're trying to portray is that things were pretty complex. And when we next time, you know, when we get to the re, the rebel the reactions against this stuff, I'm trying to show you what those people were fighting against. They what? didn't. Why do you say complex? Because there are Israelites who are real monotheists, and there are some who are on the border of polytheism. So I'm saying is... I think that, what we're seeing is an evolution. It's Well, that depends on whether you want to say an evolution. Yeah, you might say that, but the fact is, is that what I'm trying to say is that most Israelites from the earlier period fitted in to the broad definition of monotheism. There is an evolution within monotheism towards a stricter, narrower version of it, and those are the people who wrote most of the Torah, right? But this is what they were reacting against. This other kind, this very ancient kind of worship of God where God can be manifested in multiple places, God can be manifested in, in wooden poles and stone steelies, and uh, again, some of them again sort of went over the line with this. Okay. Um, the way to understand this is, let's take a look on page one of the material that I've given you. And I've titled it, The All-Encompassing God. Now, Tikva Frimer Kensky, may she rest in peace, was an extremely important Bible scholar. Unfortunately, she uh, died of breast cancer um, too young. Um, and uh, she taught at the University of Chicago. And um, she wrote this incredibly important book called In the Wake of the Goddess, Women, Culture, and the Biblical Transformation of Pagan Myth. 
this is, uh, she's one of the great, uh, first generation of great feminist Bible scholars. She was Jewish. Um, her husband, uh, Alan Kensky, is a conservative rab uh, rabbi. Um, and I, I knew both of them. Um, and Tikva also, by the way, was, uh, was involved in the early Jewish environmental movement. But anyway, in this book, she tries to show how, first of all, within pagan cultures, there was, even by the time you first see the myths being written down, the female goddesses were losing their uh, power and being subordinate to male goddesses, which she said was reflective of what was going on to women in their societies. Okay? But what they, she then says is what happens in the Israelite religion is that all of the functions of the female goddesses, which were usually concerned with fertility issues, both of the people and, uh, but also animals in the soil, get folded into yod heh vav -Heh. So how So that yod heh vav -Heh in effect, although he's depicted as male, is in effect encompasses both male and female attributes. And I think I brought some of those out to you when we showed the epithets where God, he is evoked in one case as like a mother. But it's not only that, he functions in many female attributes, the fertility of the land, which in the pagan religions was always the function of a goddess. So here is a, a kind of summary of what she uh, Asserts. Robert, you want to read it with God's oh, ability? I have to tell you, Rabbi, I think Irma should read it. This is such a <laughs> Okay, Irma, oh, read it. Irma read it. <laughs> All right, Irma, read it. Who passes the on? <laughs> with God's ability to deliver all the promises of Exodus 23, 24, through 27 to Israel, God is revealed as the master of all the forces of nature. There is no difference between powers that used to be male and those that used to be female. No sense of distinction between power over rain and over food. No gulf between power over the human body and over the natural world. In this monotheistic view, all nature is one unified field. Everything is interrelated and under the control of one deity. In this organic view of the universe, there are no forces in tension and cooperation. All of nature is unified. The rain and the earth, the physical universe, and the inner workings of the human body, all are seen as a parallel manifestation of the power of one God. All the jobs previously performed by the pantheon, all the forces exemplified by the many nature deities, now have to be performed by the one God of Israel. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So while there are Israelites who still are seeing this division between the female and the male functions of divinity, the vast majority of Israelites that we can see throughout Israelite history, all of the functions of the multiple deities of the pantheon are now absorbed into one God. Look, think about your, you know, well, you know, the Greek myths, right? You've got Zeus and you've got Athena, the goddess of wisdom, and you've got Hera, who's the goddess of the harvest, you know, Mars, uh, Ares is the god of war, you know, all these different gods have a different function. The I god of Israel has all of these. I think this is a wonderful explanation of the move towards monotheism. Exactly. It's one sentence I completely disagree with. <laughs> In this organic view of the universe, there is no forces in tension and cooperation. I think it's all about tension. Well, what she's saying is, is that in the in the in the pagan myths, you have this fight between some gods and the gods of chaos. And yes, in the earlier part of Israelite, as we are now, you know, segueing to, there is a bit of a fight between Yod Hey Vav Hey and the forces of chaos. But that gets pushed away. She's talking for, by forces, she means gods. Yes, exactly. So this is nature as opposed to different gods. Yeah, exactly. In other words, creation, she could have used the word of creation. Mm -hmm. All of creation is one unified field, mm -hmm. right? There isn't a god of the earth and god of the this and god of the goddess of that. There's just the, the creation and God 
Yeah, and God may have, have angels and other celestial servants, but the fact is there's only one real God. Yeah, but, but uh, I like the transition, but let me reiterate. Yeah, I understand. Satan and the fight with evil is a constant in the Torah and in the way we look at things. Yeah, okay. And for I would say it isn't there is just, if you'll excuse the expression, too mothering. Well, no, no, um, it's a different kind of tension than was before. I agree with you. There, there, the forces of chaos never go away. They get transformed. Um, and again, she's talking about this picture. She's talking about are the people uh, in the Torah who wrote the P and the D stuff. And she's talking about nature. She's not yeah. talking. This is the forces of nature. Yeah. She's not talking about philosophy oh, or something. Oh, tsunamis don't occur? No, no, no. Those, but all, but, no, 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 but, no, but, but, it, but in Deuteronomy, they're all manifestations of God. If something bad happens, it's because God is punishing you. That's the difference. In the stricter monotheistic view of Deuteronomy, it's not a demon. There are no demons. I'm going to get to demonology again. There are no demons. There are, there, there's, you know, Satan is, is a is a functionary of God. There's, there's not a war god fighting against the peace god. Exactly. Or a fire god exactly. fighting against the water god. If it's a... There's, it, that's you the are way. saying there is no tension in Deuteronomy. There is a tension, but humans are the ones who are the ones who cause chaos now. No divine creatures. You know, I think if you read this passage from Exodus that she's referring to, I think it's a good passage to to understand it by. Yep. She's saying, knock down all these, all, all of the... Or 23. Exodus, God is saying, knock down, smash their, their statues and their icons, beat at all of them, and and then he will do everything. All, and, and when he says he will... God says, uh, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will remove... I don't know why they go back and forth between me and I. And I will remove sickness from your midst. No woman in your land shall miscarry yep. or be barren. I will enjoy the full, uh, and I will let you enjoy the Psalm full. Psalm one sixty three, one sixty four. So, so all those, those, you know, the rain, taking care of the rain, removing sickness, yep, exactly. Miscarriage. They were formerly, or by those guys, they had a different god or goddess for each one of those functions. This God is doing all the functions. And, and, and when you look in Deuteronomy chapter 11, specifically it says, if you follow the covenant, you will have fertility of your people, your cattle, and the land. If you break the covenant, drought and death comes. Yes, but what I like about this, this is, not break those statues. Yeah, yeah. Break those right. icons or whatever they are, those but statues. It, and then I will do all of those things for you. The, the, the juxtaposition of those This is the two. God of Jay. This is the God of love. If you're good to me, I will be good to you. No, actually. No, no, no. And D is the vengeful rule. No, 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 sorry. Because it says, it says specifically, if you don't do it, you're going to lose, you're, you're going, don't defy him. Um, and the point is that if you don't do this, you're going to be in big trouble. And um, I will remove sickness from your yeah, yeah, No but, woman will miss. Yeah, Carry. yeah, but that's if you follow the covenant, right? If you right. don't follow the covenant, believe me, J and E, uh, can, J and E's version of God is just as... Just as uh, uh, can be just as uh, vengeful if you break the covenant. Believe me, oh. there's no difference in that let, regard. Let it be clearly stated. I do not believe. Well, I. <laughs> um, well, take a look. I, that is the most wonderful thing. I will remove sickness from. Yeah, me. but that's that's just only. Love but me. that's if you follow the covenant. What? No, no, not if you yeah. just love me. You have to well, do. Well, but in this context, it's not about. In the context we're talking about, it's not about what you have to do to get God's approval. It's what this God is able to do for you. Who controls these forces? Yeah, exactly. And he's saying, if you break those, those sculptures and those icons for other gods, I am in control of all those functions. The point is... Not, not do this. This is not a quid pro quo here. What, what's the real one? Let's be clear. When she says... When she says. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the point is that um, there is an evolution 
between the is between what their neighbors believed and what they believed. And eventually, as we will see, um, when these stricter views of monotheism, the P people and the D people, they are going to narrow things even more. Uh, the fact of the matter is that um, uh, the God before them is already the all-encompassing God who both who has the female functions, the male functions, who does reward but also punishes. I don't care what you say, Robert. The God of Jay punishes. And the, the average Israelite believed that God could get really angry and come down and, and bring disease and destruction. I mean, look at what, remember we looked at Psalm 18, how David describes God coming down to attack his enemies. Um, the God of yod vav is one of his aspects, is the war God, right? God of armies. Yes, Adonai Tzivaot, right? So there are different aspects of the divine character but they have encompassed now all what used to be and still is in their neighbors separate gods. They now have all in one God who does have servants, by the way. You know, the sun, the moon, the stars, the angels, the celestial hosts. But they are all subordinate and don't have independent power. Okay, um, we're barely going to get to where I wanted to get to at the end of last week, but I'm always optimistic about this stuff. Um, the fact, so, one of the things that happens, one of the manifestations of all of this, is the difference between the Israelite version of creation and their neighbor's version of creation. Okay? So, we're not going to read all of this, but if you look on page two, this is the beginning of the Enuma Elish. This is the Babylonian creation story, okay? That scholars, when it was discovered, notice how much it resembles Genesis, chap uh, Genesis, right? When the sky above was not named and the earth beneath did not bear a name and the primeval Apsu who begat them and Chaos, Tiamat, the mother of them both, their waters were mingled together. In other words, there is primordial chaos, okay? And I skipped a long part. What happens is the other gods, a bunch of the younger gods get together and they decide that Marduk is going to lead them into battle against the forces of chaos. So first of all, it talks about how Marduk is getting his bow ready and all various other things. I mean, the new militia is pretty long. Um, and anyway, what happens is, is then he gets on his chariot, you'll notice. And Marduk is a god of, of the thunderstorm, just like uh, Baal in uh, the Canaanite. And he then, he kills her, all right? He kills Tiamat, and down at the bottom of the page, he takes her body and he cuts it like a fish into two halves, and one is becomes the vault of the heavens, right? Mm -hmm. To hold back the upper waters. And in effect, what you have is this, what's called the, um, you know, the battle creation story, right? That order comes out of chaos through a battle amongst the gods. So in, oh, I see. in Genesis, there's, that's one story, and then there's another story that's quite different from that. Both stories, there's no battle. There's no battle. No. Right? But, but one is more violent than the other. No, they're not. So Neither one of them is violent. In Genesis 1 or Genesis 2, both of those creation stories, nothing opposes <laughs> God. Nothing opposes God. Now, here is a picture of Marduk killing Tiamat. This comes from the second millennium BCE. Okay, here he is. And there's Tiamat. Okay, he's splitting her in half. So we actually have um, wow. iconography of the, of the Enuma Elish. And this is very early, right? All right. Here is another one from a cylinder seal showing Marduk stepping on Tiamat, who is in the form of a sea serpent. Or a dragon, if you want to, whatever you want to call it, okay? So, um, here's another one from uh, a silver bowl. Interestingly enough, it was found in Israel. So somewhere in the end of the third millennium, beginning of the second millennium, there was some Canaanite who had uh, a silver a goblet, who maybe he got it from Babylon, who knows? The point is, it shows Marduk killing Tiamat. It's the Babylonian Enuma Elish found in Canaanite, in a Canaanite site, or whoever lived where it was found. 
Okay, so now you get to the, the, the uh, Canaanites. Did they have a similar myth? Yes, the answer is they did. Only they didn't have Marduk, they had Baal. And Baal is the word for Lord. So, in the Canaanite um, pantheon, the head of the pantheon is El. Here's a statue of El. And he's depicted as an old man sitting in a chair because he retires. He's the head of the pantheon, but he basically gives up the power to Baal. Why? Because he's got to, they've got to have him fight chaos. Yes. These are Israelites? No, these are Canaanite. Okay, so far, this is all Canaanite. It says Israelite creation theology. No, 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 no. Uh, we're going to get to the Israelite. I, I know. We'll get to it. We haven't got there yet. Okay. I'm telling you where it comes out of, the context of where it comes out of. Okay. The context is the battle myth. The fight between chaos and order is a fight amongst the gods. So, in the Canaanite one, um, there's no single long text that I could find. So, I found here a summary, a synopsis of the battle uh, a cycle. So, first you have Yom. Yom is sea. And the sea always represents chaos. Because it churns, right? Yom wants to rule over all the other gods and be the most power of all. Baal Hadad, which is the real full name of Baal, opposes Yom and kills him. Then, with the help of um, these other gods and goddesses, persuades El to allow him a palace. In effect, uh, persuades El, I'm going to become the president, so to speak, the chairman of the board. And um, so he has a palace built. And then um, Baal at, seeks to subjugate Mot. Mot is death. It's, that's in Hebrew, the word Mot means death. Okay? So then what happens? Mot kills Baal Hadad, and then Anath kills Mot, grinds him up, and scatters his ashes, and Baal Hadad comes back to life and goes to Mount Safon. Mot comes back, challenges Baal, asks him to submit. Baal refuses, and Mut submits, and Baal ends up ruling over all. That's the Canaanite myth. Similar, but not exactly the same to the Babylonians. But you'll notice, again, it's a battle myth. So here is El, and here is Marduk. Here is Baal from a 12th century stele from an acropolis at Ras Sharma, which is uh, in uh, where, which is a, a Canaanite city. And here he is, fighting, fighting chaos. Okay? So, what you have are pictures of Baal doing similar things to what Marduk did. Notice it's on a stele, it's not a statue. Okay? So, what did the Israelites have? Well... When you look at, and here, look at page 3, Genesis 1 is a P-source. And the Genesis 1 may have been written in Babylonia as a um, Israelite retort, or really Judean retort, to the Enuma Elish. In Genesis 1, the primordial chaos, Tehom, which is very similar to Tiamat, is nothing but water. It's not a god, and God doesn't have to fight. Does, god doesn't even have to use his hands, so to speak. God just speaks, and order emerges. So the worst of you, Tehom is a kind of uh, uh, remnant of the battle myth. And also when God creates the fish, it says God creates the sea monsters, the Taninim. And uh, in Isra early Israelite creation myth, that's the equivalent of Tiamat, the sea monster. Okay? Genesis 2, from the J source, also, you know, there's this kind of, uh, it's a, you know, it's, it, it, there's no fight here. God gets more down and uses his hands, so to speak, and creates a garden and so on, creates the human. But again, there's no, there's no opposition here. Right? And what's interesting is, is that um, Genesis 1 seems to be, um, there's too much water, so you've got to kind of put it, you know, make sure it's all controlled. Genesis 2 seems there's like not enough water. So that's why some people think Genesis 1 is 
uh, located or written in Babylon where the too much water was the problem. And Genesis 2 is written in Eretz Yisrael where not enough water is a problem. Okay, I mean, Genesis 1 might have, you know, might have come from an earlier pre exodic source, which is, some people think it's a piece of liturgy from the temple, actually, originally. But the point is that by the point of even Genesis 2, the J source, which is m earlier than the Genesis 1 by hundreds of years, no opposition, right? And J, of course, reflects this, is not this um, polemical, stricter monotheism. So already by the time of J, you have Israelites who are saying, no, 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 no opposition. We're not like them. Our God is the all-powerful God, creates the earth, heaven and earth, with no fight, no problems. Okay? The, the, it's very interesting that you've seen the concordance there. To some of us, that there's a major difference. There is and a big the, difference between one and t Genesis 1 and Genesis the, 2. J1 is essentially, if you excuse the expression, homocentric. Yes, it's more human-centered. Yes, it is. That's true. Whereas the other one is, is, is much more like the volcanoes of the universe. Mm -hmm. and, but it, and No, but it's very pain. mild. But it's mild. There's no violence in Genesis 1. No violence. No violence at all. Right? That's the thing you have to understand, Robert. It's a late story. The earlier stories are going to show violence, but this one shows no violence. Rabbi? Rabbi, Genesis 1 reads the earth being unformed and void, yeah. darkness on the yes, surface, yes. And deep wind, and God says. No, God is in the wind. The point is that <laughs> this is, yes, there is a cosmic mushball, okay? There's Tov Vavo, but that's not violent. It's just, it's the primordial matter. Plato basically believed the same thing, that uh, the whole of the universe came from some uh, kind of inert, primordial matter, okay? The fact is, that's what it is. It's it's like, take it's a cosmic mush ball. There's no violence there, Robert. Nothing. And you're not going to convince like me otherwise. Saying, <laughs> that's like saying the Big Bang was not violent. No, no, it's not the Big Bang, though. But it's it not the, no, it's not the Big Bang at all. It's nothing, it's not like the Big Bang at all. There is this primordial mush. Unformed. In which everything is all mixed up. And what does God do? Separates it all. God just makes sure it goes in one, it's all in place, and doesn't use his hands. He says it, and he it doesn't happens. Get the or, or the yeah, he doesn't have to do a thing. thing. Yeah. In the in the earlier story, and Jay actually has to like use his hands. Mm -hmm. Okay? But again, no violence. Okay. Now look at Psalm 104 on page 1540. No, Robert, there's no violence there. You're not going to convince me otherwise. <laughs> Now, take a look at Psalm 104. Psalm 104 is earlier than Genesis 1 and is almost like uh, a poetic first draft of it. Okay? This one, God is, it's a lot more you, about, you know, God has a body, uh, he's clothed in glory, wrapped in a robe of light, and then notice you spread the heavens like a tent cloth, you set the rafters of his lofts in the waters, makes the cloud his chariots, moves on the wings of the wind. So this is, again, this picture of Yudei Vafe, right? Makes the winds his messengers, fiery flames his servants. Then notice, he established the earth on its foundation, surely it will never totter. Those are the pillars of the earth. And by the way, here is what we're talking about. That's the Israelite cosmos. Um, the waters stood above, they fled at your blast and rushed away at the sound of your thunder. And there's no violence? No, there. this is... Fiery flames, no, his no, no, that's an aspect of God's uh, manifestation. What you have here is, you have here that God has to, they're not, again, there are no independent gods here fighting against him, but it's work. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not just I say it and it happens. It's not Genesis 2 where I basically just do it. Here, God really has to, has to sweat. Right? God is building the universe, and the waters um, need to be pushed back. They're not gods and goddesses. He, there's nothing, no fight here, but there is a bit of a schlep. Right? Okay. So, now let's go back a little further. Psalm 74. If you give me five minutes, we'll finish this. You don't mind? Okay. Psalm 74 is 
probably written after the destruction of Jerusalem because um, basically it's, because it talks in verse 7 about God's sanctuary going up in flames. Uh, 74 is, is, is a real, is a, is, is a complaint psalm. Why are you allowing the enemies to destroy your holy place and oppress us, God? Why is this happening? Why don't you wake up? Are you asleep? Right? Okay, so it's a real complaint. Now, notice, look at verse 12. You used to take care of things. O oh God, my king of old, who brings deliverance throughout the land. It was you who drove back the sea with your might. Yes, this is an earlier one. No, I, no, this is violence. Okay, Paul, listen to what I said, Robert. This is an earlier one. There was an earlier Israelite combat story, combat myth. We don't, we don't have it, but it's reflected in this text, and there's another one as well. Mm. Right? Smash the heads of the monsters, the Taninim, the sea monsters. That's what I was thinking of. When yeah. I said there were two. Exactly. You who crushed the head of Leviathan. Leviathan is the Israelite equivalent of the sea monster, the primordial sea monster. Mm -hmm. Okay? Who left him his food for the denizens of the desert. Remember? Marduk cuts up Tiamat, right? Mm -hmm. It was you who released springs and torrents and made mighty rivers. The day is yours, the night also. It was you who set in place the orb of the sun. You fixed all the boundaries of the earth, summer and winter. You made them. So in effect, he's saying, the psalmist is saying, hey, you fought the evil and the chaos in the past. Why don't you do it now? So there was an Israelite combat myth. But by the time already of Psalm 104, which is pretty early, it's gone. Doesn't mean there weren't people around who didn't know about it, but the author of Psalm 104, the author of J already, which is early, and P, they're not, they say no. If we believe in Yodei Vavhe to be the one all-encompassing God, God cannot, there is no opposition. John Levinson called it creation without opposition. Now, let's go to another text that shows um, a very similar thing. What's interesting is this is a late text, so it shows you how long some of the, the combat myth actually survives, and that's Isaiah 25. Now, Isaiah 25 to 27 um, is deemed by most biblical scholars to have been added to the book of Isaiah in the early Second Temple period. In other words, page 898. It's not part of the original collect. Isaiah, you have to understand, the book of Isaiah is a collection of a lot of different sources, some of which comes from the prophet Isaiah. Okay, So 25 to 27, they refer to it as the Isaiah apocalypse, meaning it's very much closer to apocalyptic literature from the Second Temple period. It's highly unlikely this is written in the time of Isaiah, which is the uh, late 8th century BC. This is several hundred years later. Okay, so, um, we're not going to look at all of it, but the point is, take a look at verse 6. This is a messianic vision, how the Temple Mount will eventually be a place where, you know, great meal, and then it says, he will destroy on this mount the shroud that is drawn over the faces of the people. Remember, this is the future, okay? And then notice verse 8, it says, he will destroy death forever. Now, there... Most scholars believe that you should put a capital D on death, that they are, in effect, saying he will destroy Mot, the god of death, right? Or the sub-god, the demigod of death. Most scholars believe that this is a reference to the idea that the Israelites also believed in a um, divine force called death with a capital D. And this is a late text, and there are still people who believe this stuff, okay? It shows you how long-lasting some of these ideas are. So the fact is, is that um, Mut continues to exist. Of course, they give a different explanation on the footnote, F. Mm. Yes. Yeah. It, it, but I, I, I follow those who say this is a, should be uh, a proper name, that a later editor put the the in it, mm -hmm. okay? The fact is, is that 
God didn't completely kill off, it didn't destroy death in the original creation, but eventually God will. In the future redemption, God will kill death. Okay? Now, skip to... Excuse me, when did you say this probably... Early Second Temple period. Um, if you take a look and... Da, 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 hang on. To the end of... Um, oh, yeah. Go to, go to uh, page 902. Uh, this is one of, what you have in verse um, a, uh, 19 is the idea of the resurrection of the dead, right? Again, this, is, this shows you where the belief that the dead will uh, be resurrected in the future. Again, we can't date this, um, but it's a pretty early reference to this idea, okay? We don't know if it's early. I mean, you know, again, we're not sure. But the point is, it appears that it says that in the future time, the dead will be resurrected, okay? That, it's definitely not First Temple. But then go to the beginning of chapter 27, in that day, the Lord will punish with his great, cruel, mighty sword, Leviathan, the elusive serpent. Mm -hmm. Leviathan, the twisting serpent, he will slay the dragon, the tanin of the sea. Mm -hmm. So again, the idea is, is that there was leftover chaos from the original creation. And that in the future redemptive messianic era the f will be the final defeat of death and chaos. So that's how the myth, the combat myth, gets transformed into a redemptive vision. And there's some other references to this idea as well. Job, in the latter chapters of Job, God, like in Psalm 104, is seen as having to push back the waters. It's not a violence, but it's a lot of work. So you get an evolution. There was a combat myth amongst the Israelites in which God has to fight to build the universe. It then moves into an intermediary stage where God has to work at it. You know, God's got to build the barriers and build the dikes and, you know, dams up all the waters to make sure everything is nicely controlled. And then it moves into, like Psalm 104, yeah, God's got to work, but it's not such a big deal. And then you move into Genesis 2 and Genesis 1. God doesn't, there's no work involved in this. Genesis 1 is the ultimate one, where God doesn't even have to use his hands. God just speaks, and then it happens. So that's the evolution. And, it, and again, this is evolving at the same time that the, the idea of monotheism is becoming narrower. So the creation story evolution reflects the evolution from this earlier idea of God as being having a body in multiple places, manifested in steely. Um, you know, part of that image of God is God, the warrior who comes down in a chariot, and God had to fight originally uh, the forces of chaos. But then it kind of, you know, God en ends up being this all-encompassing God in which the forces of chaos are just reduced to a nuisance. Okay? That's where we'll end today. Uh, so in three weeks... We will move into worship and ritual finally. We missed the next two weeks. Yeah, because I'm away next Wednesday and then the following is uh, Passover. Okay? So three weeks. Um, we'll move into ritual and uh, worship. Uh, again, I will not be able to do this for at least a week. I will not be able to put this up on... Um,